Hello, and welcome to Storytelling Live. Well, I imagine he's got a Cockney accent, right? Storytelling Live. He's probably angry, right? I don't know. Oh, get out of my way, little girl. Here's a check for you. <laughs> you get out of my way. So, one of the problems I have with this whole dichotomy thing is that, oh, where's the hat go? Not on the bed. How about here? How about... So, one of the things uh, that has me about the getting, that irritates me about the dichotomy of this, the whole thing, the whole thing is an essay on dichotomy, really. <clears throat> hi, Chrissy, and hi, uh, hi, sir. Hola, Sarita. Eres tu española, or you, or eres tu arabia, or... <laughs> um, anyway, uh, bienvenidos a todos, whoever you are. Hello and welcome, bienvenue. Si vous parlez français ou uh, espagnol, uh, no sé. <laughs> uh, but in any case, this dichotomy business, you'll see it's just like throughout this text. Um, oh, well, I got to mention that uh, also tonight's episode is um, also celebrating with many people across, uh, all over the world, uh, uh, across the planet, and uh, 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 100,000 Poets for Change. Have we actually got 100,000 Poets for Change? Absolutely, and guess what? I'm magic, and I will... Abra, kadabra, poof! You're all poets now, so check you out. You Look at yourself in the mirror. You're a poet now, so <laughs> uh, you uh, are now a part of this. And yes, indeed, we are more than 100,000 strong. And um, it's been going on for 10 years now. And welcome, you know, to, to the new world of change. Now, is this the change we were praying for? Well, hmm, not really, right? This is the popping of the boil that has been... Hello, Adam. Violeta, como estas? Adam Francis Cornford, como esta, senor? Um, senorissimo. Uh, I'm still doing the same stuff that I was, like, whatever... How many years ago? 14 years ago, right? <laughs> uh, Literature the Fantastic. Hello. Y como no, muchas gracias, señor. Um, profesor. Um, so, this is not the change we were looking for, right? But actually, it's a popping of the boil. And all the bile you see out on the street is just... It's not vile, it's just pus that's been festering for, hey, Adam. It's Adam saying hi to Adam. It's Adam meets Adam. Terry, what are you doing here? <laughs> Hola, Violeta. Como estas? Um, just, it's a hundred thousand poets for change. Now, what kind of change were we asking for? We we're hoping for, like, some kind of, you know, uh, educated and beautiful transition into the magnificence of the Aquarian Age, right? You know? <laughs> but, hello, everyone! <laughs> but, it's more like the popping of a boil that has been festering. And that's what we see, is pus in the streets. And, uh, 
in our government. You know? Anyway, okay. Well, I'm not going to, like, sit around here for, like, like I did last week. I'm going to try not to. Hi, Veronica. It's good to see you again. Mike, uh, you poet for small change? Dude, I'll take any kind of change, really. I will take the big change. I will take the C change. I will take the small change. I will take the change. But I will not take the change into madness. But what this is... Hey, Susan, how are you, my dear? Cool to see you here. Thank you so much for showing up. Um, the point that I'm trying to get at is that maybe we need to have Mr. Trumpster Fire, you know, show us. I'm not supposed to say his name in this program. I was warned early on by a great friend of mine that I'm not supposed to say that person's name. And then I understand that. I understand. But what I'm trying to get at is that maybe we need a giant buffoon to hold a mirror back to us. Hey, oh, thanks for seeing that. Yeah, that was so cool. You could have said something, maybe. Were you allowed to talk? I don't know, Veronica, Veronica. So, um, really. <clears throat> um, Maybe we need a big buffoon to hold a mirror back to us. I'm not sure. I guess it's the only way people can learn. If they don't learn now, well, they just vote them right the fuck back in, right? Just vote them right in. So, because cause if half of us are still like, Dirtito, maybe he's good. Maybe it's good. Oh, you were bad? <laughs> okay. It was Veronica that was too early. <laughs> Hell yeah. Stay in bed, baby. I hope you stay in bed all day long. But, you know, if you don't learn the first time around, then maybe you got to learn the second time. If half, of, if half of our country is still scratching their head, like, well, maybe it's not such a good idea to, to make everybody confused, um, uh, uh, incite rage in the public, Maybe that's not, maybe rage is not a good idea. Maybe it's not, man. You know, like, let's think about this for, for like a fraction of a second and think, hey, this is not comfortable. Let's do something comfortable. Let's do something good for all of us. How? I don't know. Number one, I'm just going to say that if you are shot in bed and your mother cries and they say that everybody who shot you in bed is actually okay, and they, they, they know what low laws were broken. Um, you got to change the laws, man. You, that, and that's when the laws need some revisiting, right? So, okay. So I'm political. Whatever. Hello, Larry. Hola, Rosana. <laughs> y sabes que es el mi estómago en este momento, no? Right? <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, I was reading an article on QAnon, and, um, and what it's talking about, this is just like during the week, you know, it was between last, you know, Saturday and today, damn, about this week, this week had some extra days in it, happy... Michael, why are you not on this program? Do you want to see... Do you want to see... Uh, uh, can you... How do, how do I get you on this? I can't. Here. Do you... Do, Michael, do you want to see... No? You might, you could. You could say something right now. I mean, now's a fine time. No? Hey, Paul. Assalamu alaikum. So glad to see you here. No? Okay. All right. So this, this is my finger pushing buttons on my uh, iPad because my uh, laptop has been doing like belly flops, man, when I turn on the... Uh, the... Oh. Ugh. What's going on? 
I think we're going to get a guest <laughs> here. This is our first guest. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work. We're going to try it out. I'll wait. Will you wait? Would you please wait for two seconds? We're going to have Mr. 100,000 Posts for Change coming on screen. I don't know if it's going to work. Hey, is that Sama? Sama Mustafa? Um, I don't know. Is this working or not? Okay, so I'm just... Hey, Veronica. <laughs> this is a little awkward because uh, it's a very unplanned moment. Actually, every single one of these is... Well, it's moderately planned because I have, like, crap that I want to say, you know, that I think about all week. This goddamn week had a few extra days in it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I thought, you know, oh, my God, you know, I'm devolving. Anyway, uh, no answer. Okay. Yes, it was great to see you earlier, and I'm glad that you stayed in bed for that, Veronica, because if I could have, I would have. You know, I put on... Uh, I put on a sport coat and a tie because in Egypt, they're all dressed very fine. Um, and uh, anyway, um, let me get back to my immediate topic that I want to talk about. I know I'm uh, jumping around. I always jump around because that's who I am. INFJ, right? That's the Briggs Myers, right? That's Mr. Jump Around. So, any case, um, it doesn't work. I tried. Oh, you're going to sleep. All right, man. Well, happy 100,000 poets for change, My, Mr. Michael and Terry. Uh, and, 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 and congratulations on 10 years of just blinding, crazy work that you guys have done, organizing people all over the globe. If it wasn't for 100,000 poets for change, if it wasn't for 100,000 poets for change, I would not know so many beautiful, wonderful poets all around the world, and I really appreciate it. You know, some people are bumming out hard on Facebook, and they're having a really bad time, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. I want you to have a good time, and I want to meet people. I want you to meet people uh, that you wouldn't, who you wouldn't normally meet, um, and, and they're beautiful people, and I really enjoy uh, meeting all these great people. Thank you. Uh, thank you for 10 years of excellence and um, and for hope and for change. Cheers. Um, what I want to say is I was reading up on QAnon. It was an article about pe families who witness people. And it's funny because I wrote a science fiction story that you will hear. XXXX. I, I, XXX. You the man. You the man. Good night. Rest your eyes, Michael. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Rewind. <laughs> but um, I was reading an article on QAnon, and it was the families who were affected by members of QAnon. I guess they're not really members. They're just, like, absorbed by this meme, right? And <clears throat> I'm hot. It's actually probably about 78 degrees, 80 degrees in this room downstairs where it should be cooler, but it's a very hot night next to the ocean. Um, and these families are talking about the transformation and I'm thinking about Jekyll and Hyde kind of transformation. They're transforming into something unrecognizable and it's, hey, Mike, Viva Globalist, absolutely. Because your friends are all around the globe, man. For real. Uh, any case. Um, <clears throat> so what they're doing is they are absorbing a meme it's like a way of thinking about the world that actually it sort of inverts uh, perception in a bizarre way. And perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll's, uh, Dr. Jekyll's, uh, uh, as they say in the movie, the 30s movie with Frederick March, um, 
maybe his concoction, maybe his chemical drink uh, alters his perception of reality, like uh, some kind of a negative acid trip, right? Well, this meme alone does it. And in my science fiction story that you will hear later on, keep watching this. I've got a plan. We're going to finish this. We're going to do some detectives. Then we're going to do a ghost. And then we're going to um, uh, fit in my um, uh, uh, science fiction story with this uh, that mentions memes. Um, and then we're going to have, uh, in the new year, we will have uh, a, a close reading of, uh, of uh, Frankenstein of the modern Prometheus. So we'll be talking about that and whatever. Um, we'll talk about golem stories and stuff like that. But transformation, because of a thought, that's pretty powerful. And the families are saying in the article that, it, that, their, that their loved ones are, hey, Billy, what's happening, bro? Um, the, the, uh, their family members are unrecognizable, and that's just like Mr. Hyde. So I was thinking about that. Now, speaking about unrecognizable Mr. Hyde, what I wanted to say about him is that it kind of pisses me off that um, in Victorian times, I've got a few notes here on my phone. Uh, this is on the back of my phone. My friend uh, uh, Jean-Michel gave it to me uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's kind of cool. So uh, the sticker, not the phone, is not that generous. He should have given me the phone too, man, right? But um, the Victorians in this story uh, seem to say that they have a patent mistrust of anything that's not average. That everything that, that, that doesn't fit in to the very sections that everybody has memorized in this society. So everybody's got their station, and don't you move from it. You're, you're, it's like a caste system almost, right? Um, they try to gauge people by deformity versus well-shaped, short versus tall, a gentleman versus like someone who hasn't got means, right? So therefore, a tall and visibly pale or white well-dressed gentleman is culturally beyond reproach or suspicion in this world and in this world the dark the short the malformed those people are immediately mistrusted the poor of course they'll can commit a crime well they're poor and the and the and the rich people of the high station well they they're just they're just doing their best in life and well Tut, tut. Well, anyway, all that crap really kind of pisses me off. But it doesn't affect <laughs> my fascination with this crazy story, which is an allegory, which makes me think. Was Stevenson aware? Or was he, was he aware of the mores of uh, 19th century? And was he writing them in explicitly to make light of them? Because we know now that he wrote it from our notes and discussion last week, we know that he wrote it as a uh, 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 as a um, as an allegory, right? So here we are, and where are we anyway? Ah, here we are. So does anyone remember where we were, where we left off last week? It was Utterson. Let me see here what I can. Uh, so um, I'm looking at my text over here. You're right here. And I can see everyone over here. Hey, everyone. But I can't see you if I'm looking over here. So I might not see you if you come through uh, while I'm reading. Um, let's just begin with the Carew murder case. Are you ready? Stick with storytelling live. Even on a day like this, man, when everybody else has a live stream rolling, um, 
I got some great stories lined up for you, for real. You got to check it. <laughs> okay, Veronica, you're right, man. The Carew murder case. Nearly a year later, in the month of October 18, something, something, London was startled by a crime of singular ferocity and rendered all the more notable by the high position of the victim. Ooh, high position. Get me? So, I mean, I think he wrote some of these details in here on purpose uh, to make light of society as it was at that time. It's a perfect snapshot to me, um, albeit fictional, but all the principles of, of Victorian society are in here. So, the high position of the, of the victim. The details were few and startling. A maid servant living alone in a house not far from the river, the Thames, had gone upstairs to bed at about 11. Although a fog rolled over the city in the small hours, the early part of the night was cloudless, and the, and the lane which the maid's window overlooked was brilliantly lit by the full moon. It seems she was romantically given, for she sat down upon her box, which stood immediately under the window and fell into a dream of musing. Never, she used to say with streaming tears when she narrated that experience, never had she felt more at peace with all men, with all humans, or thought more kindly of the world. And, so, and as she so sat, she became aware of an aged, beautiful gentleman with white hair, drawing near along the lane and advancing to meet him, another and very small gentleman, to whom at first she paid less attention. When they had come within speech, which was just under the maid's eyes, the older man bowed and accosted the other with a very pretty matter of politeness. It did not seem as if the subject of his address were of great importance. Indeed, from his pointing, it appeared, it sometimes appeared as if he were only acquiring, inquiring his way. The moon shone on his face as he spoke, and the girl was pleased to watch it. It seemed to breathe such an innocent and old-world kindness of disposition, yet with something high, too, as of a well-founded self-content. Presently, her eye wandered to the other, and she was surprised to recognize in him a certain... Mr. Hyde, who had at once visited her master and for whom she had con conceived a dislike. He had in his hand a heavy cane with which he was trifling. Yes, with which he was trifling. But he answered never a word and seemed to listen with an ill-contained impatience. Then, then, all of a sudden, he broke out in a great flame of anger, stamping with his foot, brandishing the cane, and carrying on, as the maid described it, like a madman. The old gentleman took a step back with an air of one very much surprised with the trifle hurt, and at that, Mr. Hyde broke out of all bounds and clubbed him to the earth, and the next moment, with ape-like fury. He was trampling his victim underfoot and hailing down a storm of blows under which the bones were audibly shattered and the body jumped upon the roadway. At the horror of these sights and sounds, the maid fainted. It was two o'clock a.m. when she came to herself and called for the police. The murderer was gone long ago. But there lay his victim in the middle of the lane, incredibly mangled. The stick with which the deed had been done, although it was of some rare and very tough and heavy wood, had broken in the middle under the stress of this insensate cruelty, and one splintered half had rolled in the neighboring gutter. The other, without doubt, had been carried away by the murderer. A purse and gold watch were found upon the victim, but no cards or papers, except a sealed and stamped envelope, which he had been probably carrying to the post, and which bore the name and address of Mr. Utterson. 
This was brought to the lawyer the next morning before he was out of bed, and he had no sooner seen it and, and been told the circumstances. Then he shot out a solemn lip. I shall say nothing until I have seen the body, said he. This may be very serious. I have the kindness to wait till I... Uh, to, I have the, have the kindness to wait while I dress. And with the same grave countenance he hurried through his breakfast and drove to the police station, whither the body had been carried. As soon as he came to the cell, he nodded. Yes, said he, I recognize him. I'm sorry to say that this is Sir Danvers Carew. Good God, sir, exclaimed the officer, is it possible? And the next moment his eye lighted up with a professional ambition. This will make a deal of noise, he said, and perhaps you can help us to the man. And he briefly narrated what the maid had seen and showed the broken stick. Mr. Utterson had already quailed at the name of Hyde, but when the stick was laid before him, he could doubt no longer broken and battered as it was, he recognized it for one that he himself presented many years before to Henry Jekyll. Is this Mr. Hyde, a person of small stature? He, he inquired, particularly small and particularly wicked looking, is what the maid calls him, said the officer. Mr. Utterson reflected and then raising his head, if you will come with me in my cab, he said, I think I can take you to his house. It was by this time about nine in the morning and the first fog of the season, a great chocolate-covered pall, a great chocolate-colored pall, lowered over heaven. But the wind was continually char charging and routing these embattled vapors, so that as the cab crawled from street to street, Mr. Utterson beheld a marvelous number of degrees and hues of twilight, for here it would be dark like the back end of evening, and there would be a glow of rich, lurid brown like the light of some strange conflagration, and here for a moment the fog would be quite broken up, and haggard shaft of daylight would glance in between the swirling wreaths. The dismal quarter of Soho under these changing glimpses with its muddy ways and slanting slatternly, slatternly passengers and its lamps, <clears throat> which had never been extinguished or had been kindled afresh to combat this mournful reinvasion of darkness, seemed, in the lawyer's eyes, like a district of some city in a, in a nightmare. The thoughts of his mind, besides, were of the gloomiest dye, and when he glanced at the companion of his drive, he was conscious of some or touch of that terror of the law, and that law's officers, which may at times assail the most honest, so, what that's we've just crossed over a passage that is what brought me to bring up Jekyll and Hyde at this point. Because if you're in California, because if you're in the Western United States, this is what we've been experiencing for weeks. Actually, in the past week, seven days, it has cleared up. But we've been seeing skies like this for real. And it says as if some kind of conflagration. But we did have a real conflagration. But what they had back then was actually volcanic ash way up in the high atmosphere, which created a cooling, a global cooling. And then everybody out of their chimney, out of their little stove, out of every little, every little pipe clay pipe sticking out of a the roof of a building was <clears throat> a coal chimney and everybody was pumping coal up into the atmosphere in london and it turned the fog into smog and it turned that smog from gray into yellow and into shades of brown like we have seen and of course, this 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 is a carriage scene. They're running through uh, uh, the streets of London in a horse-drawn carriage, right? Um, a car. They were called. It was called a car. Uh, um, and uh, the guy is looking out the window at the amazing wafts 
of brown interluded with sunlight. And what a scene it must have been at 9 a, excuse me, at 9 a.m. So the sun should have been bright and cheery, but it wasn't. And he says the lamps weren't lit because it looked like it was evening. <laughs> and of course the lamps would have just been put out, right? As the cab drew up before the address indicated, the fog lifted a little and showed him a dingy street. Virgin Palace, a low French eating house, a shop for the retail of penny numbers and two penny salads, and many ragged children huddled in the doorways and many women of different nationalities passing out key in hand to have a morning class. And the next moment, the fog settled down again upon that part brown, as brown as umber, and cut him off from his black, godly surroundings. This was the home of Henry Jekyll's favorite, of a man who was heir to a quarter of a million sterling. An ivory-faced and silvery-haired old woman opened the door. She had an evil face, smoothed by hypocrisy. But her manners were excellent. Yes, she said, this was Mr. Hyde's, but he was not alone. He had been in that night very late, but he had gone away again. Though he was not at home. He had gone away again in less than an hour. There was nothing strange in that. His habits were very irregular, and he was often absent. For instance, it was nearly two months since she had seen him till yesterday. Very well, then. We wish to see his rooms, said the lawyer. And when the woman began to declare it was impossible, I had better tell you who this person is, he added. This is Inspector Newcomen of Scotland Yard. A flash of odious joy appeared upon the woman's face. Ah, said she, is he in trouble? What has he done? Mr. Utterson and the inspector exchanged glances. He don't seem a very popular character, observed the latter. And now, my good woman, just let me and this gentleman have a look about us. In the whole extent of the house, which but for the old woman remained otherwise empty, Mr. Hyde had only used a couple of rooms, and these were furnished with luxury and good taste. A closet was filled with wine. The plate was of silver, the napery, elegant. A good picture hung upon the walls, a gift, as Utterson supposed, from heaven, Henry Jekyll who was much of a connoisseur, and the carpets were of many piles and agreeable in color. At this moment, however, the rooms bore every mark of having, having been recently and hurriedly ransacked. Clothes lay upon the floor with their pockets inside out, locked fast drawers stood open, and on the hearth there lay a pile of great ashes, as though many papers had been burned from these embers the Inspector disinterred the butt of a green checkbook, which had resisted the action of the fire. The other half of the stick was found behind the door, and as this clinched his suspicions, the officer declared himself delighted. A visit to the bank with several thousand pounds were found to be lying to the murderer's credit, completed his gratification. You may depend upon it, sir, he told Mr. Utterson. I have him in my hand. He must have lost his head, or he never would have let the stick, or above all, burn the checkbook. Why, money's life to the man. We have nothing to do but wait for him at the bank. Get out the handbills. This last, however, was not so easy of accomplishment, for Mr. Hyde had numbered few familiars. Even the master and of the servant maid uh, had only seen him twice. His family could nowhere be traced. He had never been photographed, and the few who could describe him differed wild, widely, as common observers will, only on one point where they agreed, and that was the haunting sense of unexpressed deformity with which the fugitive impressed his beholders. I love it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's juicy stuff, man. I mean, it's full of like high and low and this and that, and, you know, and, and well, we're going to get to the bottom of this case. Absolutely. This is strange case. 
act of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And we're enjoying it to the very nth degree here. Just a minute. <clears throat> Incident of the letter. It was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was at once admitted by Poole and carried down by the kitchen offices and across a yard, which had once been a garden, to the building which was indifferently known as the laboratory or dissecting room. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon, and his own taste being rather chemical than anatomical, had changed the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. It was the first time that the lawyer had been received in that part of his friend's quarters, and he eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity and gazed around with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theater. Once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus as the floor strewn with crates littered with packing straw. You know, uh, good note, good note, sir. A good note, sir, Adam and Francis Cornford. Um, this these fogs were crap, absolutely. Yes, the electric heaters, ugh. Yes, London Air, London Air, I wish, I wish London still had fog, but apparently it's not. It's as balmy as California in London uh, today. It's just, you might as well be in Los Angeles. It's not the same, there's not the fog, there's not the rain. There's not a Christmas snow, right? This is all this stuff happened under the uh, the mini ice age that uh, Krakatoa had created. And yes, spiderwebs galore, the Victorian era, and seances and all that stuff. Yes, the fogs are gone, sir. The fogs are gone. And it's too bad, too, because nothing like a Thames with a fog on it, you know, right? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. So at the further end, yes, yes. So here we are in, it used to be at one time, this theater was crowded with eager students, now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw and the light falling dimly through the foggy copula. At the other end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red bays. And through this, Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room fitted round with glass presses furnished, among other things, with a cheval glass and a, a business table looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. The fire burned in the grate. A lamp, a lamp was lighted on the chimney shelf for even in the house of the fog, even inside the houses, the fog began to lie thickly. And there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deathly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. And now, said Mr. Rutterson, as soon as Poole had left them, you have heard the news? The doctor shuddered. They were crying it in the square, he said. I heard it. I heard them in my dining room. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client. But so are you. And I want to know what I'm doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow. Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor. I swear to God that I will never set eyes on him again. I bind my honor to you that I am done with him in this world. It is at, it is all at an end, and indeed it does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe, quite safe. Mark my words, he will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He did not like his friend's fervid, feverish manner. You seem pretty sure of him, said he, and for your sake, I hope you may be right. If it came to a trial, your name might appear. I'm quite sure of him, replied Jekyll. 
I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone. But there is one thing on which you may advise me. I have, I have received a letter, and I am at loss whether I should show it to you now or to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Otterson. You would judge wisely. I'm sure I have so great a trust in you. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detection, asked the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. I was thinking of my own character, which is this hateful business, which this hateful business has rather exposed. Utterson ruminated a while. He was surprised at his friend's selfishness and yet relieved by it. Well, he, as said he at last, let me see the letter. The letter was written in an odd, upright hand and signed Edward Hyde, and it signified briefly enough that the, the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had long so unworthily repaid for, thousand, for a thousand generosities, needed need labor under no alarm for his safety, as he had means of escape on which he placed a sure dependence. The lawyer liked this letter well enough. He put a better color on the intimacy that he had looked for, and he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. Have you the envelope? he asked. I burned it, replied Jekyll, before I thought what I was about, but it bore no post postmark. The note was handed in. Shall I keep this and sleep upon it? asked Utterson. I wish you to judge for me entirely, was the reply. I have lost confidence in myself. Well, I shall consider, returned the lawyer. And now one word more. It was uh, it was Hyde who dictated the terms in your will about that disappearance. The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Dr. Utterson. Said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You had a fine escape. I, I have had what is far more to the purpose returned the doctor solemnly. I have had a lesson. Oh, God, Utterson, what a lesson I have had. And he covered his face for a moment with his hands. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word or two with Poole. By the by, said he, there was a letter handed in today. What was the messenger like? But Poole was positive nothing had come except by post and only circulars by that he added this news sent off the visitor with his fears renewed plainly the letter had come by the laboratory door possibly indeed it had been written in the cabinet and if that were so it must be differently judged and handled with more caution the newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the footways. Special edition! Shocking murder of an MP! That was the funeral oration of one friend and client, and he could not help a certain apprehension, lest the good name of another could be should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. It was at least a ticklish decision that he had, that he had to make, and self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. It was not to be had directly, but perhaps he thought it might be fished for. Presently after, he sat on one side of his own heart, with Mr. Guest, his head clerk, upon the other. And midway between, at a nicely calculated distance from the fire, a bottle of, of a particular old wine that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of his house. The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles. And through the muffle and smother of these fallen clouds, the procession of the town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries with a sound as of a mighty wind. But the room was gay with firelight. In the bottle, the acids were long ago resolved. The imperial dye had softened with time as the color grows richer in stained windows, and the glow of hot autumn afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free and to disperse the fogs of London insensibly 
The lawyer melted. There was no man from whom he kept fewer secrets than Mr. Guest, and he was not always sure that he kept as many as he meant. Guest had often been on business to the doctors. He knew Poole. He could scarce have failed to hear of Mr. Hyde's familiarity about the house. He might draw conclusions. Was it not as well that he should see letter which put that mystery to right? And above all, since Guest, being a student and critic of handwriting, would consider the step natural and obliging, the clerk, besides, was a man of counsel. He could scarce read so strange a document without dropping a remark, and by that remark Mr. Utterson might shape his future course. This is a sad business about Mr. Danvers, he said. Yes, sir, indeed. It has elicited a great deal of public feeling, returned Guest. That man, of course, was mad. I should like to hear your views on that, replied Utterson. Uh, I have a document here in this handwriting. In his handwriting, it is between ourselves, for I scarce know what to do about it. It's an ugly business at the best, but here, it, there it is, quite your way, a murderer's autograph. Guest's eyes brightened, and he sat down at once and studied it with a passion. No, sir, he said. Not mad, but it is an odd hand. And by all accounts, a very odd writer, added the lawyer. Just then the servant entered with a note. Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir? Inquired the clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Only an invitation to dinner. Why, do you want to see it? One moment. I thank you, sir. And the clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside and sedulously compared the contents. Thank you, sir, he said at last, returning bold. It's a very interesting autograph. There was a pause during which Mr. Utterson, Mr. Utterson struggled with him himself. Why do you compare them, guest? He inquired suddenly. Well, sir, returned the clerk, there's a rather singular resemblance. The two hands are in many points identical, only differently sloped. Rather quaint, said Utterson. It is, as you say, rather quaint, returned guest. I wouldn't. Speak of this note, you know, said the master. No, sir, said the clerk. I understand. But no sooner was Mr. Utterson alone that night than he locked the note into his safe where it reposed from that time forward. What, he thought, Henry Jekyll, forge for a murderer? And his blood ran cold in his veins. So I need to read you the incident of Dr. Lanyon. But before that, before that, if my batteries will allow me, I need a little break. Because I love you. <laughs> Where's my little break music? Chaka, chaka, chaka. Let me see. Let's play something that's not going to right destroy facebook right right i mean playing the ramones i wish i could play the ramones i wish i could play you many different things but instead i will play you something from my own uh musical uh collection and i had better hit it quick because i'm feeling uh anyway a little break people um, here's a cute one. I need a break. Be right back.
That was um, that was fun. I recorded that one in Seattle, and um, uh oh, just one moment. Oh, I had no idea because my uh, neighbors are holding some kind of gathering or party in uh, their driveway, which we share a driveway. Oh, I can't play. Uh, I don't have. Uh, I I don't have. I, next time I'll play some some petticoat. Um, but uh, thanks, Adam. Thank you. Um, but what I'm trying to say is my neighbors are having a party like in their garage and we share a driveway and so like they're uh, out there and i thought they were done but they're not so i was gonna open it up and let some uh, cool night air in but uh, actually they're too noisy or maybe i'm too noisy you know hey i'm shouting in weird accents right you know what the heck is that about right um anyway uh so that last song was recorded in um Seattle and uh, it was fun because I had a studio my whole music studio was underneath my bed I had made a loft and put my bed up top and underneath was the studio that was all where all the recording equipment was so I invited this guy Joe over his name was Joe he just, I don't remember his name just call him Joe Cello and he um, he uh, came in and I just fed him some wine and he's like I'm ready to go now I'm ready to record okay cool and recorded that piece that you heard and it was marvelous and i've kept it for years and it's a beautiful piece and i hope you enjoyed it um you could see more of that on Bandcamp, and that is uh the band name is uh, transfigurate at bandcamp.com thank you for staying uh during my little break <laughs> i feel so spoiled thank you very much um in any case Incident of Dr. Lanyon. Time ran on. Thousands of pounds were offered in reward for the death of Sir Danvers. It was resented uh, in, as a public injury, uh, but Mr. Hyde had disappeared out of the can of police as though he had never existed. Much of his past was in earth, indeed, and all disreputable tales came out of the man's cruelty, at once so callous and violent of his vile life, of his strange associates, of the hatred that seemed to have surrounded his career, but of his present whereabouts, not a whisper from the time he had left the house in Soho on the morning of the murder. Of the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out, and gradually, as time drew on, Mr. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Utterson began to recover from the hotness of his alarm and to grow more at quiet with himself. The death of Sir Danvers was, to his way of thinking, more than paid for by the disappearance of Mr. Hyde. Now that his evil influence had been withdrawn, a new light began for Dr. Jekyll. He came out of his seclusion, renewed his relations with his friends, became once more the familiar guest and entertainer, and whilst he had always been known for charities, he was now no less distinguished for religion. He was busy, he was much in the open air, and he did good. His face seemed to open and brighten as if with an inward consciousness of the service. And for more than two months, the doctor was at peace. On the 8th of January, Utterson had dined at the doctor's with a small party. Lanyon had been there, and the face of the host had looked from one to the other as in the old days, when the trio were inseparable friends. On the 12th, and again on the 14th, the door was shut against the lawyer. The doctor was confined to the house, Poole said, and saw no one. On the 15th, he tried again, and was again refused and having now been used to the last two months to see his friend almost daily, he found this return of solitude to weigh upon his spirits the fifth night he had in guest to dine with him. The sixth, he betook himself to Dr. Lanyon's. 
There, at least, he was not denied admittance, but when he came in, he was shocked at the change with the doctor's appearance. He had his death warrant written legibly upon his face. The rosy man had grown pale. His flesh had fallen away. He was visibly balder and older, and yet it was not so much these tokens of a swift physical decay that arrested the lawyer's notice as a look in the eye and quality of manner that seemed to testify some deep-seated terror of mind. It was unlikely that the doctor should fear death, and yet that was what Utterson attempted to suspect. Yes, he thought, he is a doctor. He must know his own state, and that his days are counted, and the knowledge is more than he can bear. And yet when Mr. Utterson remarked upon his ill looks, it was with an air of great firmness that Lanyon declared himself a doomed man. I have had a shock, he said, and I shall never recover. It is a question of weeks. Well, life has been pleasant. I liked it. Yes, sir, I used to like it. I sometimes think we knew all. We should be more glad to get away. Jekyll is ill, too, observed Utterson. Have you seen him? But Lanyon's face changed, and he held up a trembling hand. I wish to see or hear no more of Dr. Jekyll. <coughs> he said in a loud, unsteady voice, I am quite done with that person, and I beg that you will spare me an illusion to one whom I regard as dead. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson, and there, after considerable, considerable pause, can't I do anything, he inquired. Nothing can be done, returned Lanyon. He will not see me said the lawyer. I'm not surprised at that, was the reply. Some day, Utterson, after I'm dead, you may perhaps come to learn the right and wrong of this. I cannot tell you, and in the meantime, if you can sit and talk with me of other things, for God's sake, please stay and do so. But if you cannot keep clear of this accursed topic, then in God's name go, for I cannot bear it. As soon as he had got home, Utterson sat down and wrote to Jekyll complaining of his exclusion from the house, asking the cause of his unhappy break with Lanyon. And the next day brought him a long answer, often very pathetically worded, and sometimes darkly mysterious, in drift. The quarrel with Lanyon was incurable. I do not blame our old friend, Jekyll wrote, but I share his view that we must never meet. I mean from henceforth to lead a life of extreme seclusion. You must not be surprised, nor must you doubt my friendship, if my door is often shut even to you. You must suffer me to go my own dark way. I have brought on myself a punishment and a danger that I cannot name. If I am thief, ha, if I am chief of sinners, I am the chief of sufferers also. I could not think that this earth contained a place for sufferings and terrors so unmanning. And you can do but one thing. Utterson, to lighten this destiny, and that is to respect my silence. Utterson was amazed. The dark influence of Hyde had been withdrawn. The, the doctor had returned to his old tasks and amities a week ago. The prospect had smiled with every promise of a cheerful and honored age, and now, in a moment, friendship and peace of mind and the whole tenor of his life were wrecked. So great and unfair to change pointed to madness. But in view of Lanyon's manner and words, there must lie for it some deeper ground. A week afterwards, Dr. Lanyon took to his bed, and in something less than a fortnight, he was dead. The night after the funeral at which he had been sadly affected, Utterson locked the door of his business room, and sitting there by the light of a melancholy candle, drew out and set before him an envelope addressed by the hand and sealed with the seal of his dead friend. Private. For the hands of G. J. Utterson, alone, and in case of his predeceased, to be, to be destroyed 
unread. So it was, emphatically, emphatically superscribed. And the lawyer dreaded to behold the content. I've buried one friend today, he thought. What if this should cost me another? And he condemned the fear as a disloyalty and broke the seal. Within, there was another enclosure likewise sealed and marked upon the cover as not to be opened until the death or disappearance of Mr. Dr. Henry Jekyll. Utterson could not trust his eyes. Yes, it was disappearance. Here again, as in the mad will which as in the mad will, which he had long ago restored to its author, here again were the idea of a disappearance in the name of Henry Jekyll bracketed. But in the will, that idea had sprung from the sinister suggestion of the man Hyde. It was set there with a purpose all too plain and horrible, written by the hand of Lanyon. What should it mean? A great curiosity came on the trustee to disregard the prohibition and dive at once to the bottom of these mysteries. But professional Jekyll, absolutely, uh, <clears throat> but, but the will, that idea had sprung from sinister suggestion of the man Hyde. It was then there sent with a purpose all too plain and horrible, written by the, doc, the hand of Doc, written by the hand of Lanyon, what should it mean? A great curiosity came on the trustee to disregard the prohibition and dive at once to the bottom of these mysteries. But professional honor and faith to his dead friend were stringent obligations, and the packet slept in the inmost corner of his private safe. It is one thing to mortify curiosity, another to conquer it, and it may be doubted if, from that day forth, Utterson desired the society of his surviving friend with the same eagerness. He thought of him kindly, but his thoughts were disquieted and fearful. He went to call indeed, but he was perhaps relieved to be denied admittance. Perhaps in his heart he preferred to speak with Poole upon the doorstep and surrounded by the air and sounds of an open city rather than to be admitted into that house of voluntary bondage and to sit and speak with its inscrutable recluse. Poole had, indeed, no very pleasant news to communicate. The doctor had appeared now more than ever confined himself to the cap or the lavatory, where he would sometimes even sleep. He was out of spirits. He had grown very silent. He did not read, and it seemed as if he had something on his mind. Utterson became so used to the unvarying character of these reports that he fell off little by little in the frequency of his, vi of his visits. <clears throat> this might be our last section for the night. Let me check. Nope, I can go one. Ooh, that's a long one. Well, I'll try to make it through. Whoa, that's a long one. Whoa, that's a long one. Well, I'll see what I can do. Oh, my goodness, that's a long one. Whoa, that's a long one. What are we at? 8.30? <sighs> Incident at the window. It chanced on Sunday when Mr. Utterson was at his was on his usual walk with Mr. Enfield. That their way lay once again through the by street, and that when they came in front of the door, both stopped to gaze at it. Well, said Enfield, that story's at an end, at least. We shall never see more, Mr. Hyde. I hope not, said Doctor, said Mr. Utterson. Did I ever tell you that I once saw him and shared your feeling of repulsion? It was impossible to do one without the other, returned Enfield. And, by the way, what an ass you must have thought me not to know that this was a back way to Dr. Jekyll's. It was partly your own fault that I found it out, even when I did. So you found it out, did you? said Otterson. But if that be so, we may step into the court and take a look at the windows. To tell you the truth, I'm uneasy about poor Jekyll, and even outside. I feel as if the presence of a friend might do him good. 
The court was very cool and a little damp and full of premature twilight, although the sky high up overhead was still bright with sunset. The middle of the three windows was halfway open, and sitting close beside it, taking the air with an infinite sadness of mien, like some disconsolate prisoner Utterson, saw Dr. Jekyll. What? Jekyll, he cried. I trust you better. I am very low, Utterson, replied the doctor drearily. Very low. It will not last long. Thank God. You stay too much indoors, said the lawyer. You should be out whipping up the circulation like Mr. Enfield and I. This is my cousin, Mr. Enfield, uh, Dr. Jekyll. Come now, get your hat and take a quick turn with us. You are very good, sighed the other. I should like to very much, but no, no, it's quite impossible, I dare not. But indeed, Mr. Utterson, I'm very glad to see you. This is really a great pleasure. I would ask you and Mr. Enfield up in place is really not fit. Why then, said the lawyer, good-naturedly, the best thing we can do is to stay down here and speak with you from where we are. That's just what I was about to venture to propose. I returned the doctor with a smile, but the words were hardly uttered before his smile was struck out of his face and succeeded by an expression of such abject terror and despair as froze the two gentlemen below. They saw it but for a glimpse. The window was instantly thrust down. And that glimpse had been sufficient. And they turned and left the court without a word. In silence, they too traversed the by street. And it was not until they had come into a neighboring thoroughfare where even upon a Sunday there were still some stirrings of life. And that Mr. Utterson at last turned and looked at his companion. They were both pale. And there was an answering horror in their eyes. God forgive us, God forgive us, said Mr. Utterson. But Mr. Enfield only nodded his head very seriously and walked on once more in silence. The Last Night and my friends, I'm afraid this is a little bit too long for me to actually maybe, I don't know, I will try to plow through this and we will see what's going on. I can't wait to see the transformation go on. Um, we've got a lot, a lot to uncover here um, in this strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll, uh, end with a poem. <laughs> no, I won't end with a poem. Poem, poem is poem time. Story time, storytelling live is not poem time. You know, um, we are together in this space, listening to a story, an entertaining, mildly entertaining story, um, understanding its cultural ramifications. Uh, and um, we are here enjoying one another's company and I will not make the moment more about me with a poem by me. I think I would go ahead and just um, read some more of this last night. And I don't know even how many, let me see here. I shall mark this and then we will trot on a little bit through the text. Mm. Yeah, there are like 10 pages to this section. Mm. Mm. 38. Mm. And we are on page 29. So it's like nine pages. I'm not sure we can get through it all. Mm. It's 840. Mm. It's a little late, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to keep you. Um, so let's just read a little bit of this. The Last Night. Mr. Utterson was sitting by his fireside one evening after dinner when he was surprised to receive a visit from Poole. 
Remember, Pool is the the butler. Jekyll's butler. That's who Pool is. P O O L E. Pool. Bless me, Pool. What brings you here? He cried. And then, taking a second look at him, what ails you? He added. Is the doctor ill? Mr. Utterson, said the man, there is something wrong. Take a seat, take a seat, and here's a glass of wine for you, said the lawyer. Now take your time and tell me plainly what you want. You know the doctor's ways, sir, replied Poole. And how he shuts himself up. Well, he's shut up again in the cabinet, and I don't like it, sir. I wish I may die if I like it. Mr. Utterson, sir, I'm afraid... Now, my good man, said the lawyer, be explicit. What are you afraid of? I've been afraid for about a week, returned Poole, doggedly disregarding the question, and I can bear it no more. The man's appearance am amply bore out his words. His manner was altered for the worse, and except for the moment when he had first announced his terror, he had not once looked the lawyer in the face, even now. He sat with a glass of wine untasted on his knee and his eyes directed to a corner of the floor. I can bear it no more, he repeated. Come, said the lawyer. I see you have some good reason. Pool, I see there's something seriously amiss. Try to tell me what it is. I think there's been foul play, said Pool, hoarsely. Foul play, cried the lawyer, a good deal frightened and rather inclined to be irritated in consequence. What foul play? What does the man mean? I don't say, sir, was the answer. But will you come along with me and see for yourself? Mr. Utterson's only answer was to rise and get his hat and greatcoat. But he observed with wonder the greatness of the relief that appeared on the butler's face, and would perhaps no less that the wine was still untasted when he set it down to follow. It was a wild, cold, seasonable night of March, with a pale moon lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her, and a flying rack of the most diaphanous and lawny texture. The, wine, the wind made talking difficult. It flecked the blood to the face. It seemed to have swept the streets and usually bare passengers besides. But Mr. Utterson thought he had never seen that part of London so deserted. He could have wished it otherwise. Never in his life had he, had he been unconscious, had he been conscious of so sharp a wish to see and touch his fellow creatures. For struggle as he might, there was borne upon his mind a crushing anticipation of calamity. The square, when they got there, was full of wind and dust, and the thin trees in the garden were lashing themselves along the railing pool who had kept all the way a pace or two ahead, now pulled up in the middle of the pavement, and in spite of the biting weather, took off his hat and mopped his brow with a red pocket handkerchief. But for all the hurry of his coming, these were not the dews and exertion that he wiped away, but the moisture of some strangling anguish. For his face was white, and his voice, when he spoke, was harsh and broken. Well, sir, he said, here we are, and God grant there be nothing wrong. Amen, Poole, said the lawyer. Thereupon the servant knocked in a very guarded manner. And the door was opened on the chain, and a voice asked from within, Is that you, Poole? It's all right said Poole, opened the door. The hall, when they entered it, was brightly lighted up. The fire was built high, and about the hearth the whole of the servants, men and women, stood huddled together like a flock of sheep. At the sight of Mr. Utterson, the housemaid broke into hysterical whimpering, and the cook, crying out, Bless God, it's Mr. Utterson, ran forward as if to take him in her arms. What, what, are you all here? said the lawyer peevishly. Very irregular, very un unseemly. Your master will be far from pleased. They're all afraid, said Poole. Blank silence followed. No one protesting. Only the maid, 
lifted her voice and now wept light, loudly. Hold your tongue, Poole said to her with a ferocity of accent that testified to his own jangled nerves. And indeed, when the girl who had so suddenly raised the note of her lamentation, they had all started and turned towards the inner door with faces of dreadful expectation. And now, continued the butler, addressing the knife boy, reach me a candle and we'll get through this We'll get this through hands at once. And he begged Mr. Utterson to follow him and led the way to the back garden. Now, sir, said he, you come as gently as you can. I want you to hear, and I don't want you to be heard. And he see here, sir, if by any chance he was to ask you in. Don't go. Mr. Utterson's nerves at this unlooked-for termination gave a jerk that nearly threw him from his balance, but he recollected his courage and followed the butler into the laboratory building through the surgical theater with its lumber of crates and bottles to the foot of the stair. Here, Poole motioned to him to stand on one side and listen while he himself setting down the candle and making a great and obvious call on his resolution, mounted the steps and knocked with a somewhat uncertain hand on the red baize of the cabinet door. <laughs> Mr. Utterson, sir, asking to see you, he called, and even as he did so, once more violently signed the door to, signed to the lawyer to give ear. Shh. A voice answered from within. Tell him I cannot see anyone, it said complainingly. Thank you, sir, said Poole, with a note of something like triumph in his voice. And taking up his candle, he led Mr. Utterson back across the yard into the great kitchen where the fire was out and the beetles were leaping upon the floor. Sir, he said, looking Mr. Utterson in the eyes, was that my master's voice? It seems... Much changed, replied the lawyer, very pale, but giving look for look. Changed? Well, yes, I think so, said the butler. Have I been twenty years in this man's house to be deceived about this voice? No, no, sir. Master's, vo Master's made away with. He was made away with eight days ago when we heard him cry out upon the name of God and who's in there instead of him and why it stays there that thing. It's a thing that cries to heaven, Mr. Utterson. This is, very, this is a very strange tale, Poole. It's a rather wild tale, my man, said Mr. Utterson, biting his finger. Suppose it were as you suppose. Supposing Dr. Jekyll to have been, well, murdered. What could induce the murderer to stay? That won't hold water. It doesn't commend itself to reason. Well, Mr. Utterson, you are a hard man to dissatisfy, but I'll do it yet, said Poole. All this last week, you must know, him or it, whatever it is that lives in that cabinet, has been crying day and night for some sort of medicine and cannot get it to his mind. It was sometimes his way, the master's, that is, to write his orders on a sheet of paper and throw it on a stair. Let me throw it upon the stair, yes, and I would catch it. We've had nothing else this week back, nothing but papers and a closed door, and the very meals left there to be smuggled in when nobody was looking. Well, sir, every day and twice and thrice in the same day, there have been orders and complaints as I have been sent back and flying to all the wholesale chemists in town. Every time I brought the stuff back, there would be another paper telling me to return it because it was not pure and have another order to, different, to a different firm. This drug is wanted, bitter, bad, sir, whatever for. Have you seen any of these papers? asked Mr. Dodderson. Poole felt in his pocket and handed out a crumpled note with the lawyer, which the lawyer, bending near to the candle, carefully examined. Its contents ran thus. Dr. Jekyll presents his compliments to Monsieur Ma, he says that their last sample is impure and quite useless to the present purpose in the year 18-something-something. Dr. J purposed a somewhat large quantity from the messieurs. 
but he now begs him to search with most sedulous care, and should any of the same quality be left, forward it to him at once, expenses no consideration. The importance of this to Dr. J can hardly be exaggerated. So far, the letter had run composedly enough, but here, with a sudden splutter of the pen, the writer's emotion had broken loose. For God's sake, he added, find me some of the old. This is a strange note, said Mr. Utterson, then sharply, how do you come to have it open? The man at Ma's was main angry, sir, and he threw it back to me like so much dirt, returned Poole. This is unquestionably the doctor's hand, do you know? resumed the lawyer. I thought it looked like it, said the servant rather sulkily, and then with another voice, but what matters hand of right? He said, I've seen him. Seen him? Repe repeated Mr. Utterson. Well, that's it, Poole. It was this way. I came suddenly to the theater from the garden. It seems he had slipped out to look for this drug or whatever it is, for the cabinet door was open. And he, there he was, at the far end of the room, digging among the crates. He looked up when I came in, gave a kind of cry, and whipped upstairs into the cabinet. It was but for one minute that I saw him, and the hair stood upon my head like quills, sir. If that was my master, why had he a mask upon his face? If it was my master, why did he cry out like a rat and run from me? I have served him long enough, and then the man paused. The man paused and passed his hand over his face. These are all very strange circumstances, said Mr. Utterson. But I think I begin to see daylight. Your master, Poole, is plainly seized with one of those maladies that both torture and deform the sufferer. Hence, for aught I know, the alteration of his voice, hence the mask and the avoidance of his friends, Hence his eagerness to find this drug by means of which the poor soul retains some hope of ultimate recovery. God grant that he not be deceived. This is, there, there is my explanation. It is sad enough, Poole, I ain't appealing to consider, but it is plain and natural, hangs well together, and delivers us from all exorbitant alarms. Sir, said the butler, turning to a sort of mottled pallor, that thing was not my master. And there's the truth. My master, here he looked around him and began to whisper, is a tall, fine build of man. And this was more of a dwarf. Utterson attempted to protest. Oh, sir, cried Poole. Oh, sir, cried Poole. Do you think I do not know my master up to twenty years? You Do you think I do not know where his head comes to in the cabinet door where I saw him every morning of my life? No, sir, that thing in the mask was never Dr. Jekyll. God knows what it was, but it was never Dr. Jekyll. And it is the belief of my heart that there was murder done. Pooh, replied the lawyer. If you say that, it will become my duty to make certain, as much as I desire to spare your master's feelings, much as I am puzzled by this note which seems to prove him to be still alive, I shall consider it my duty to break in that door. Ah. Mr. Utterson, that's talking, cried the butler. And now comes the second question, resumed Utterson. Who's going to do it? Why... You and me, was the undaunted reply. That's very well said, returned the lawyer. And whatever comes of it, I shall make it my business to see you are no loser. There's an axe in the theater, continued Poole, and you might take the kitchen poker for yourself. The lawyer took that rude but weighty instrument into hand and balanced it. Do you know, Pooh, he said, looking up, that you and I are about to place ourselves in a position of some peril? You may say so, sir, indeed, returned the butler. It is well, then, that we should be frank, said the other. We both think more than we have said. Let's make it a clean breast. The masked figure that you saw, did you recognize it? Well, sir, it went so quick, and the creature was so doubled up that I could hardly swear that was the answer. But if you mean... 
Was it Mr. Hyde? Why, yes, I think it was. You see, it was much of the same bigness, and it had the same quick, light weight with it. And then who else could have got in my laboratory door? You have not forgot, sir, that at the time of the murder, they had, he had still the key with him. That's not all. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Utterson, if you've ever met this Mr. Hyde. Yes, said the lawyer. I once spoke with him. Then you must know, as well as the rest of us, that there was something queer about the gentleman. Something that gave a man a turn. I don't rightly know how to say it, sir, beyond this, that you felt in your marrow a kind of cold and thinness. I own I felt something of what you describe, said Mr. Utterson. Quite so, sir, returned Poole. Well, when that masked thing, like a monkey, jumped from among the chemicals and whipped into the cabinet, it went down my spine like ice. Oh, I know it's not... <clears throat> it's not evidence, Mr. Utterson. I'm book-learned enough for that. But a man has his feelings, and I give you my Bible word, it was Mr. Hyde. Aye, aye, said the lawyer. My fears incline to the same point. Evil, I fear, founded. Evil was sure to come of that connection. Hey, truly, I believe you. <clears throat> I believe poor Harry is killed, and I believe his murderer. Uh, for what purpose God alone can tell, is still lurking in his victim's room. Well, let our name be vengeance. Call Bradshaw. The footman came at the summons, very white and nervous. Pull yourself together, Bradshaw, said the lawyer. This is suspense. I know. It's telling upon all of you, but it is now our intention to make an end of it. Pool here and I are going to force our way into the cabinet. If all is well, my shoulders are broad enough to bear the blame. Meanwhile, lest anything should really be amiss or any malefactor is, seek to escape by the back, you and the boy must go round the corner with a pair of good sticks and take your post in the Labrador, at the laboratory door. We give you ten minutes to get to your stations. As Bradshaw left, the lawyer, the lawyer looked at his watch. And now, Poole, I guess they would have a, they would have a hand watch at that point. And now, Poole, let us get to ours, he said, and taking the poker under his arm, led the way into the yard. The scud had banked over the moon, and it was now quite dark. The wind, which only broke in puffs and drafts into that deep well of building, tossed the light of the candle to and fro about their steps until they came to the shelter of the theater, where they sat down silently to wait in London hummed solemnly all around. But nearer at hand, the stillness was only broken by the sounds of a footfall moving to and fro along the cabinet door. So it will walk all day, sir, whispered Poole. Aye, and the better part of the night, only when a new sample comes from the chemist, there's a bit of break. Ah, oh, it's an ill conscience that it's such an enemy to rest. Ah, oh, sir, there's blood foully shed in every step of it, but hark again a little closer. Put your heart in your ears, Mr. Utterson, and tell me, is that the doctor's foot? The, the, the footsteps fell lightly and oddly with a certain swing. For all that went so slowly, it was different indeed from the heavy creaking tread of Henry Jekyll. Utterson sighed. Is there never, is there never anything else? He asked. Poole noticed. Poole nodded. Once, he said. Once I heard it weeping. Weeping? How's that? Said the lawyer, conscious of a sudden chill of horror. Weeping like a woman or a lost soul, said the butler. I came away with that upon my heart. I could have wept too. But now the ten minutes drew to an end. Poole disinterred the axe from under a stack of packing straw. The candle was set upon the nearest table to light them to the attack. And they drew near with bated breath to where that patient foot was still going up and down, up and down, in the quiet of the night. Jekyll! 
cried Utterson in a loud voice. I demand to see you. He paused a moment, but there came no reply. I give you fair warning. Our suspicions are aroused, and I must and shall see you, he resumed. If not by fair means, then by foul. If not of your consent, then by brute force. Utterson, said the voice. For God's sake, have mercy. Ah, that's not Jekyll's voice. It's Hyde's, cried Utterson. Down with the door, Poole. Poole swung the axe over his shoulder. The blow shook the building, and the red blazed door leaped against the lock and hinges. A dismal screech, as of a mere animal terror rang from the cabinet up went the axe again and again the panels crashed and the frame bounded four times the blow fell but the wood was tough and the fittings were of excellent workmanship and it was not until the fifth that the lock burst and the rack of the door fell inward on the carpet the besiegers appalled by their own right and stillness that had succeeded stood back a little and peered in uh, there lay the cabinet before their eyes in the quiet lamp light a good fire glowing and chattering on the hearth, the kettle singing in its thin strain, a drawer or two open papers neatly set forth on the business table, and near the fire, the things laid out for tea, the quietest room, you would have said, and for but for the glazed presses full of chemicals, the most commonplace that night in London. Right in the middle, there lay the body of a man sorely contorted and still twitching. They drew near on tiptoe, turned it on its back, and beheld the face of Edward Hyde. He was dressed in clothes far too large for him, clothes of the doctor's bigness. The cords of his face still moved with the semblance of life. But life was quite gone, and by the crushed file in the hand of and the strong smell of kernels that hung upon the air, Utterson knew that he was looking upon the body of a self-destroyer. We have come too late, he said sternly. Whether to save or punish, Hyde is gone to his account, and it only remains for us to find the body of your master. The far greater proportion of the building was occupied by the theater, which filled almost the whole ground story and was lighted from above and by the cabinet, which formed an upper story at one end and looked upon the court. A corridor joined the theater to the door on the by street, and with this, the cabinet communicated separately by a second flight of stairs. There were besides a few dark closets and spacious cellar. All these may, all these they now thoroughly examined. Each closet needed but a glance, for all were empty, and by the dust that fell from their doors had stood long unopened. The cellar, indeed, was filled with crazy lumber, most dating from the time of the surgeon, who was Dr. Jekyll's predecessor. But even as they opened the door, they were advertising the uselessness of the further search by the fall of the perfect mat of cobweb which had for years sealed at the entrance. Nowhere was there any trace of Henry Jekyll dead or alive. Poole stamped on the flags of the corridor. He must be buried here, he said, hearkening to the sound. Or he may have fled, said Utterson. And he turned to examine the door on the by street. It was locked and lying nearby on the flags, and they found the key already stained with rust. This, this, this does not look like use, observed the lawyer. Use? echoed Poole. Do you not see, sir? It is broken, much as if had, a man had stamped on it. I continued Utterson, and the fractures too are rusty. Two men, the two men looked at each other with a scare. This is beyond me, Poole, said the lawyer. Let us go back to the cabinet. They mounted the stair in silence and still with an occasional awestruck glance at the dead body, proceeded more thoroughly to examine the contents of the cabinet. At one table, there were traces of chemical work. Various measured heaps of some white salt being laid upon glass saucers as though for an experiment in which the unhappy man had been prevented. That's the same drug I was always bringing him, said Poole, and even as he spoke, the kettle with a startling noise boiled out. This brought them to the fireside, where the easy chair was drawn cozily up, and the tea things stood ready for the sitter's elbow, the very sugar in the cup, 
There were several books on a shelf. One lay beside the tea. Things open and Dr. Utterson, or Mr. Utterson, I should say, was amazed to find in it a copy of pious work for which Jekyll had several times expressed a great esteem annotated in his own hand with startling blasphemies. Next, in the course of their review of the chamber, the, the searchers came to the cheval glass into whose depths they looked with an involuntary horror. But it was so turned as to, to show them nothing but the rosy glow playing on the roof, the fire sparkling in a hundred repetitions along the glazed front of the presses, and their own pale and fearful countenances stooping to look in. This glass has seen some strange things, sir, whispered Poole. And surely none stranger than itself echoed the, lay, the lawyer in the same tones. For what did Dr. Jekyll... He caught himself up at the word with a start, and then conquering the weakness, what could Jekyll want with it? He said. You may say that, said Poole. Next, they turned to the business table. On the desk, among the neat array of papers, a large envelope was uppermost and bore in the doctor's hand the name of Mr. Utterson. The lawyer unsealed it, and several enclosures fell to the floor. The first was a will drawn in the same eccentric terms as the one which he had returned six months before, to serve as a testament in case of death, and as a deed and gift uh, in case of despair is built, but in place of the name of Edward Hyde, the lawyer, with indescribable amazement, read the name of Gabriel John Utterson. He looked at Poole, then back at the paper, and last of all, the dead malefactor stretched upon the carpet. My head goes round, he said. It has been all these days in possession. He had no cause to like me. He must have raged to see himself displaced, and he has not destroyed this document. He caught up the next paper. It was a brief note in the doctor's hand and dated at the top. Oh, Poole, the, doctor, the lawyer cried. He was alive and here this day. He could not have been disposed of in so short a space. He must still be alive. He must have fled. And then why fled? And how? And in, in that case, can we venture to declare the suicide? Oh, we must be careful. I foresee that we may yet involve your master in some dire catastrophe. Won't you read it, sir? Asked Poole. I won't, because I fear replied the lawyer solemnly. God grant I have no cause for it. And with that, he brought the paper to his eyes and read as follows. My dear Utterson, when this fall, when this shall fall into your hands, I shall have disappeared. Under what circumstances I have not the penetration to foresee, but my instinct and all the circumstances of my nameless situation tell me that the end is short and must be early. Go then and first read the narrative which Lanyon warned me was to place in your hands. And if you care to hear more, turn to the confession of your unworthy and unhappy friend, Henry Jekyll. There was a third enclosure asked Utterson. What? Well, it's here, sir. <clears throat> here, said, uh, here, sir, said Poole, and gave him in his hands a considerable packet sealed in several places. The lawyer put it in his pocket. I would say nothing of this paper. If your master has fled or is dead, then we must at least save his credit. It is now ten. I must go and read these documents in quiet. I shall be back before midnight when we shall send for the police. They went out, locking the door of the theater behind them. And Utterson, with the dead body inside, and Utterson, once more leaving the servants gathered about the fire in the hall, trudged back into his office to read two narratives which this mystery was now to be explained. And there, my friends, I must end it until next week. <laughs> um, I sense you guys are drowsing off at this point. I will mark our place, and I look forward to hanging with you 
next week. And we have so much to do. We have so much to say. I'm looking through the rest of this text and there is more. And it's going to be chow, chow, chow. And it's going to be wonderful. And I thank you for hanging with me this long, this late. Happy 100,000 Poets for, for Change Day. And we will um, definitely uh, check this out because basically what's coming up. No drought? You're not drowsing? Ah, well, cool. I'm glad you're hanging with me. And I hope you're getting the story. I'm totally into it. Yeah, Veronica, right on. I'm so glad to see you're here. Um, <laughs> I've got to wrap it up, though. Uh, I should wrap it up. It's, it's great. I wish we were all in a giant bed together. Not sexually, but like in thick and cozy PJs with a blankie and whatever else we need. Perhaps a little drinky poo. Yes? <laughs> um if you're if you don't have a beverage of your choice while listening to storytelling live i wish that you would please grab yourself the beverage of your choice when you start listening to this i don't care if it's mushy tea <laughs> it's totally a campfire that's exactly what this is if i could set a fire ablaze between us i would but we have the california wildfires to thank for that and why don't you just, you know, fire is supposed to be something warm and comfortable like that. Yes, not a bane to civilization and perhaps affecting the world economy. You know, we're going to be, I love fire though. Um, anyway, so here's my silvery brown tie for the evening. Yes, yes. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> I love, the, no, campfire. No, Veronica, you're cool. Uh, let's all take a bath and throw in a toast. <laughs> let's all, you know, let's not and say we did. Uh, let's take a bicycle ride. You know, let's hold hands and ride the bicycle together. Let's do something else. Anyway, as you can see behind me, it's totally dark. And my neighbors are probably still at it. I hope I can get some sleep tonight. Vio, what are you doing, Violeta? You're still here. Muchas gracias para estar aquí con nosotros, con, con todos. Thank you so much. Oh, so last, uh, next week, you know, we're not even... We're not even out of this yet, but I'm enjoying the time. And you saw a little bit of the London uh, pollution that we have uh, going on, which is really reminiscent of uh, the skies of the, um, of the uh, early days of the uh, Western wildfires. Um, anyway, thank you for being here tonight. I enjoy you very much. And I'm very glad that you were here uh, and that you have listened to everything. Uh, this is a cool story. The way it rolls is, is kind of cool because it's, um, it's in pieces and we piece it together as we read through. So next week is Dr. Lanyon's narrative. There's lots more to go through and it's fascinating, all of it. We're going to have a great time coming up Oh, thank you, Quattro. Yeah, baby. And then uh, if you haven't seen, yes, Mike, if you haven't seen the Coney Island uh, uh, Film Festival yet, you have until October 2nd to watch that. And we are in Section 10, which is Made in Coney Island. And everybody loves that section because, um, you know, it's all about Coney Island. And um, uh, Coney Island's, you know, I'm not telling you it's like a spick and span, like amazing area. You know, it's not a Disneyland. It's like a third rate Disneyland, right? It's like, that's what its charm is, is it's, it, it, it is, uh, 
it's you know it's like uh it's bubble gum stuck to the wall it's like cotton candy you pick up from the from the from the ground you know <laughs> it's a little junky coney island and the people who run the coney island museum are these cool people who are basically the the description i can think of the best to fit them the best are the punk rock carnies right they're not actually carnies you know but they're yeah oh they're kind of like carnies and um they got you know top hats lots of tattoo sleeves next week is groucho marx's 130th birthday so we'll be looking out for that too so i'm really <sighs> Every day is weirdness from our country, from our government, and disappointment in the streets. If the brute logic of the situation rules against, if the brute logic of the, of the situation overrules the stupid judicial judgment, then the laws must change. And I don't know, defunding, sure, let's defund uh, the police, but actually, it's time to write new laws. Number one, don't break into someone's house. I think it was at like 1230 in the morning. It's 915, Calif 917 California time. And if somebody were to knock on my door right now, I would be suspicious. I would not like that one one bit. And I might actually get kind of protective about, about my place. And if it's the cops, I would not be happy to see the police. And I have done nothing wrong, right? Ugh. Anyway, um, you know, the one guy who got arrested was the fucking asshole who went out into the street and just started firing through a curtained window just wow like you know wild wild west man like what's going on with your brain dude what kind of training did you receive you know no no anyway um all of them no you know if that was your daughter who got shot in her boyfriend's house you know or it was in her own house her boyfriend's just sitting there right Anyway, 2nd of the October. Thank you very much, Mr. Laxtone. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. I am just afraid of what this next week might bring us. You've got to hug your, 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 your loved ones. You've got to tell them you love them. Don't hold back. That's what these times are telling us. If you go out in the streets and you protest, I won't blame you. But wear a helmet. Wear some roller skating knee pads and elbow pads and helmet and everything that you need. Go there on your roller skates. Don't wear any clothes, but do wear the appropriate pads. Maybe bring a squirt gun filled with vinegar for the cop's eyes or something like that. But they've got, you know, they've got their own protection. I don't know, man. I, I just, I wish us all the best for this next week. I look forward to seeing you next week. And I hope it's going to be a gentle one. As always, if you have stuff to say, write me. Private message me. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Good night.